Okay, it is noon, that's what my clock says. So welcome, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, you are now in the Small Farms Conference marketing session. And this session is scheduled to run from right now until 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. Announcements and questions will be made throughout the session in the chat box. So if you want to view that chat box or post something in there, most likely it's down at the bottom. You move your mouse down there uh, towards the bottom of the screen and you'll click a little chat bubble to get into the chat box. And this brings up the window on the right-hand side of your screen. So you can also click that little chat bubble to make the um, chat go away. Slides are gonna be posted at a later date on our website. So if you need to go back and review things, that'll be an option. Um, I'm Sarah Hansen and I work with Purdue Extension in Johnson County as an agriculture and natural resources um, extension educator. And I wanted to acknowledge all of our many sponsors today. Um, we'll get to, here's kind of overall, um, but we do have one specific one for today as well. Looks like everybody's doing great um, on using Zoom, but I will say, please mute yourself as you come in. Um, if you'd like to participate, you can navigate down to the bottom and raise your hand. You can unmute. Um, if we see that you've raised your hand, we can um, help you to ask your question. Or um, you can also, like I said, use the chat box feature. Today, closed captioning has been enabled. And so um, you can also go down towards the bottom of your screen to navigate through that. There's a little closed captioned icon and you can select to hide it or close it if you don't want it there. And what you should see right now is a QR code and a slide that says um, you're here for the marketing session. This is a way to report the demographic information. It's a voluntary thing that we do. Um, so you can scan the QR code or if you check the chat box, I think Ashley has so graciously put the link in there for you to click straight to go fill out that survey. Here is our sponsor for today, the National Young Farmers Coalition. All right, now I'm gonna stop sharing. And then I'm gonna turn it over here. I'll just introduce Heather Tallman. She's with the American Dairy Association, Indiana chapter. She works with stakeholders to create valuable connections amongst retailers, wholesalers, distributors, and operators of grocery stores. She has also served as the director of Indiana Grown. So Heather, I'm gonna let you take it away now. Thank you, Sarah. Thank yeah. you. I'm gonna keep an eye on the time because I wanna make sure to get this in. There's a lot of content in a small amount of time. And what I've chosen to do is to take a very general look on marketing for agribusiness. And I'm gonna give you just some highlights here. And you're gonna hear some of this and say, well, I already do this or this doesn't really apply to me. So I'm giving you kind of what I've gleaned over the last 15 plus years of working with different levels of agribusiness from someone who's learning how to market their beef to someone who has a barbecue sauce and they're looking to expand their business. So once you've established your agribusiness and you're ready to move on to the next level, one thing that I had been asked so many times was how do I approach a distributor or a retailer uh, because I want to sell my product, but I need help. Well, that is two very different conversations because some retailers allow you to sell directly to them. Some of them will allow you to deliver from your location to the, uh, to the store, to the distribution warehouse. Um, and that's a great scenario. I find that it's, it's fairly rare. They want you to go through a distributor so they can just buy from one or two people instead of buying from dozens and dozens. Um, and as retail operations grow throughout the state of Indiana, there's really kind of like five big players and they all want it to come through their distribution center. So if it is coming through a controlled way, um, some of the smaller grocery stores, uh, people have had great success and you may hear that today, people who have had success self-delivering. 
So um, I'm not going to spend as much time talking about that because those, those are nuanced situations that you will have discussions between yourself and that buyer and everyone's situation is very different. But here is some of the baseline information that I would give someone when they contacted me saying I'm a new business or a newer business. How do I start from the beginning to the, to the next level? And so uh, some of the things that I came across that I always was a little bit surprised about was that someone had a business, meaning they were creating a product or processing a product or packaging a product, and they did not have insurance. And I would ask them, do you have insurance, business insurance? They'd say, well, I have homeowner's insurance. And I'd say, well, that's not the same thing. Uh, do you have insurance for your business? And they, they a lot of times didn't. Um, and so I find that when I've spoken with insurance agents, just the generic, what I'm told from them is that, um, you know, you want to have insurance to protect you from liability as a result of selling products or services or, um, you know, just whatever it is that you're making. But you need to have insurance to protect the equipment and the property um, that you need to do business. So, um, even if you're at the farmer's market, if you are making a food and you should happen to make someone ill, you need to be covered for that liability. And there are some um, agribusiness owners that are kind of getting started that don't know about business insurance, haven't thought about it, don't have it. And so I kind of feel like that's step one uh, for me when I was a business owner is to be insured. Um, next would be do you know who you're trying to sell to? Do you know who the demographic is that you're trying to sell to? Are you living in a community and making a product uh, that is so unique and original that the price point is not something that your community that you're trying to sell to can afford or understand? So maybe you know identify the demographic who's gonna be buying your product. Um, next would be, how do you set your farm apart? How are you different? If you have honey, how are you different from the neighboring farm that also has honey? How is your honey different? Are you displaying that in your messaging? Um, now, I'm sorry, I'm getting some messages pop up for people who are waiting in the lobby. So I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I'm just going to keep, keep going. I'm not sure if that is for me. Um, so once you have a product and you are insured, next, what about that business plan? That's another thing I've heard a lot about are business owners that don't have a business plan, a backup plan, or a cushion. What if you finally get in at Kroger and Kroger says, well, I like your bottles of barbecue sauce, but they're too tall for the shelf. We need shorter bottles. Or your caps won't work. Or your caps are stuck on a ship in the Suez Canal. What is your backup plan? Do you have one? Have you thought about it? And so sometimes you need someone who can walk you through those steps. And this is where I'm going to put, a, put in a plug for the Indiana Small Business uh, Development Center. They have a new agribusiness initiative. And so if you're a business owner out there and you need a little bit of help, I would say elevate that through ISDA's contact Victoria Herring, and she can um, move you through the chain at ISBDC's agribusiness initiative. It is a free service to give you that help. They can help you where Indiana Grown and IS, or ISDA can't. They could give you business plan help and also guidance on navigating financing and finding grants. Um, we, they can't necessarily do those things. Um, next, uh, something that I was asked a lot was, I need a logo, I need branding, I need help. Well, there are two free uh, baseline platforms that you can use that are very user-friendly. You can even do it on your phone. One is Canva. The other is PicMonkey. Uh, you could use just like the very basic um, I plan. You could pay like an upgraded, like for more choices and backgrounds, but you could also just use it for free. Or if you need a logo or a graphic, there's a website called Fiverr, and that's two R's. And you can find someone there. You can hire a graphic designer. I've used that in the past. I've spent anywhere from six or seven dollars to several hundred dollars to have graphics and logos created. Of course, you can find some locally as well. And I would urge you to try to look locally before you look online, of course. 
Um, so now you've got a, you're insured, you're, you know, you're trying to sell to, you know what your product is, you have a business plan, you have a logo, you are a business, now you're ready to launch on social media. Now this could be a whole other session. Um, so I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of social media. I feel very passionately about responsible social media use as a business owner, especially right now. Um, so my opinion as someone who is kind of an independent contractor right now where this is concerned is if you launch a social media account, you keep it business. It should be named what your product is or what your business is. And the messaging you put out there should be all business all the time. What is going to sell your product? What is going to help you spread the word about your branding? Later, you're going to hear from Mike Koopengardner, which I will tell you does a fantastic job with his social media. I'm not saying that because I can see him on my screen right now. I mean it. Um, so anyhow, just wanted to uh, put that out there. Happy to speak to anyone about social media another time, but there's it's just such a wide open space that everyone's needs are so different. Everyone's skill level is so different. My uh, two cents here is just to keep it business. If you wanna launch a website, a static web page that gives the who, what, when, where, and why of who you are, uh, there are free or slightly um, small charge websites that kind of walk you through building just a static web page. Um, Wix, W-I-X is one of them. And of course, WordPress, which has been around forever. Um, I bought my first .com in 2004 through WordPress uh, and Blogger, which I don't even think is a thing anymore. Very easy to use. Um, I still use WordPress and I don't have a problem with it and I am not skilled in that area. Next, I would say join farmer associations. If you are a farmer or you are producing a product using a farm, if you're an agribusiness, um, making something in the state of Indiana, join all the organizations that make sense for you. Some of them you're going to pay and like a membership fee and some of them you aren't. Um, I would highly recommend uh, anything. If you're a young farmer, then you should join anything that has young farmer in the title. Um, Farmers Union, Indiana Farm Bureau. If you are doing anything with specialty crops, you should join any group that involves specialty crops any specialty group organizations, like if you're a veteran. And of course, you should join Indiana Grown because it's free. Um, attend farm-related events uh, to network and hear other points of view. Uh, I will say over the course of many years, I don't know how many events I attended or I spoke or networked or just saw people that I later had to call and say, hey, you told me about this product two years ago. I've got a person for you. It's very valuable. And it's definitely um, something that you need to be doing. Ooh, I need to hurry. Um, and you need to begin advertising. So whether that is working with your local chamber, tourism board, or newspaper, you just need to do something. Um, I'm seeing that it's 1213. And so uh, I had other points that I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on because I don't want to eat into Marcus's time to talk because he is a distributor and I feel like that is kind of what we're here to hear to hear about. Um, labels and UPC codes and packaging. Package for what your buyer wants. Your product probably has very specific packaging. If you're working with a distributor, they're going to tell you how it needs to be packaged. Um, UPC codes, I cannot emphasize enough that you shouldn't buy them until you need them. That is just my opinion. And you should buy them from a website that is G s1us.com. Don't just buy one for every product you make. You may never need one. So wait to buy them until you need them. That website can walk you through that process. Um, do not invest until you investigate. Don't just invest and buy and do all these things until you actually need it. It may take you years to get to the level that you want to be at that requires it. Um, there are so many great agribusinesses in the state of Indiana, so many great makers um, who I think could be a mentor to you. Be Free Granola is one of them just right off the top of my head. Carrie Abbott with Newfangled Confections is another. They would be great people to reach out to to talk about this process. Um, <clears throat> obviously, if you're selling in retail locations, you have to process in an inspected facility. I think that goes without saying. And the last thing I would say is you really need to understand the market that you're trying to sell in. Um, everyone who makes a barbecue sauce says their friends love it, tells them they should buy it or bottle it and sell it. I mean, that's everyone's story. And maybe one out of every 10 really is going to hit the retail shelves. 
So you have to stand out with your story or your ingredients, your labeling, or your ability to hustle that product. So um, you have to have some kind of understanding of where your product is. So just because you can go to a show doesn't mean you should. You should just kind of have some basic understanding of what uh, you want to get out of it. So before you go, but you have to be where the people are. Um, I, th I This is a topic I love and I'm not going to say anymore. I'm actually going to introduce um, someone who's going to speak briefly and then we're going to open it up for a little bit of q and It's 1215 and we only have 15 minutes left in the session. Again, my name is Heather Tallman. I'm very easy to find if you have questions after the fact. Um, Sarah Hansen or Ashley may put our information in the chat at some point, I don't know, but I'm pretty easy to find. You can find me and send me an email anytime um, and I'm happy to help you. So I'm gonna introduce Marcus Agresta. He's the president of Piazza Produce and Specialty Foods. So throughout our time, I was at Indiana Ground, so before it was created through last June, um, we had a lot of great partners. Piazza was one of them. Not only was Marcus on our commission uh, the last three or four years, uh, Piazza was the first distributor in the state of Indiana to put our logo on their trucks that went all over the state. So I want to go ahead and introduce him. He's going to talk about some of the things that he says to people when they call. He really has five things that he says to a new customer that they need to come back with whenever they uh, want to do business with them. So I'm going to go ahead while well, he's on here. So he just needs to unmute himself. Hey, Marcus. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Good. Uh, well, thanks for uh, having me and inviting me. Uh, obviously, uh, Heather's a, a wealth of knowledge and uh, uh, you can call her anytime and she'll uh, lead you the right way so yeah uh, I think one of the important things you know if you don't know much about our company um, we were founded in 1970 um, and really we've been supporting local producers uh, from the very beginning you know whether it was uh, buying corn or watermelon or uh, you know tomatoes things like that so it's always been on our our blood to to support our our Indiana producers. So uh, very proud that we've been doing that for over 50 years, and we we always want to continue to do that as well. So the world has changed, obviously from from 1970, and you know things like food safety and insurance and things like that. You know you didn't really have to have, uh, but Obviously, for good reason, uh, those things have become very important. So I always start with what's your food safety program. If you know, we really uh, will not be able to uh, do business with anyone who just does not have a uh, an audit or uh, you know some of the food safety things that uh, are required. You know, so I'm not an expert in food safety. Uh, we do have a food safety director. Uh, I can certainly have uh, Heather share her contact information and uh, we can get you going on the right path. I know that uh, Purdue Extension has some great resources there as well. So really, we we need that in place uh, prior to uh, anything else. And also, you know, some insurance type of things go along with that. But if you can get through those things, um, you know, packaging is a big thing that we often run into, you know, questions like how many should I put in a case? You know, what, what kind of case should it be? You know, cardboard or should it be this or that? You know, what do I need on the, on the packaging? And we can certainly invite you uh, anytime to uh, tour the warehouse and kind of see what others are doing or, uh, you know, what those dimensions might be and those pack sizes might be. So that's something that, that we get a lot and are more than willing to, to help uh, educate people on that. Uh, then that kind of leads into the next thing, which is, uh, well, let me back up. Packaging is important. And then the other thing that usually comes along with that too is uh, 
you know, what's your uh, supply lines like? You know, are you a, if you're a grower, you know, we need to talk about how many cases we might move of a certain product. Uh, if you have barbecue sauce, like uh, Heather was talking about, uh, you know, where do we pick it up at? Uh, where is it being produced? So we ask some of those questions and we can sometimes help with logistics as well. If we're uh, in a particular city or town uh, making deliveries, we could always uh, back all those products, which is nice. And then we usually get into these pricing discussions, which are always interesting. Um, typically, um, folks are used to, you know, getting retail pricing at a farmer's market per se. Uh, and sometimes people think that that's what we're going to pay, but that's usually not the case. Uh, we are here to make a profit. So um, trying to understand uh, what margin is uh, available to the distributor because we are performing a function, you know, of warehousing, uh, you know, buying inventory, and then invoicing customers, collecting money from customers. So, you know, we're, we think we're good people, but uh, we're not going to do it for free. So we have to find a, a happy medium there to where you're still able to you know, make a profit and uh, we can provide you with the services that are necessary. And another thing that's that's usually uh, a plus, I think, is the folks that are already doing distribution on their own, um, you know, making their own deliveries, uh, will eventually find out that that's not a great use of their time. It, it is in the beginning because you can talk to the customer yourself and, you know, actually uh, you know, be able to get your name out there, but eventually uh, folks find that it's not the best use of their time to be driving and they can spend that time driving, spending more time with their customers, believe it or not. So if you have a book of business that you're able to get us started on, you know, we're more apt to uh, bring someone on if they're able to say, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to you know, Bloomington three days a week and I'm, I've got five customers there. Uh, you know, if you're able to kind of hand that book of business over to us and then we can uh, take care of that for you, <clears throat> that's helpful because then it gives us some volume. You know, it gives us uh, product in a warehouse. And then from there, we can open that up to our whole uh, group of customers. So, and, and, you know, with that too, we're able to wrap around our sales folks, uh, our marketing, our social media, you know, our uh, support so that uh, kind of plug into to what we do. That's kind of some basic things. I'd, I'd be more happy to elaborate on any of these topics or if you've done listening to me, you want me to hang up, I can do that too. No, please stay on. <laughs> we appreciate um, <laughs> having Heather here. And having Marcus as well, kind of a bonus. Um, let's maybe open it up for questions if you guys are ready for that. Yeah, sure. People can either put it in the chat. Um, you can raise your hand. You can unmute. We've got 40 people in here, so we can't all talk at the same time. But Well, until I see a question pop up, I think a lot of people ask about packaging, like how do they know what kind of packaging their individual product should be in? Um, what is your advice for someone who comes to you and says, well, how should I package? Do it, should it be tamper proof? Should it be in totes or boxes or bottles of glass? Um, what is your advice to someone to maybe get them to pump the brakes possibly? Yeah, I, I think it's always best to, you know, come and visit us if we get to that point, and uh, we can certainly show you how we're getting corn in from, say, you know, a, a certain supplier or how we uh, package, uh, you know, other shelf stable items. So I think that's always the best way to is to actually, you know, come and visit, and we can show you some 
similar products so that you can have an idea of maybe what's your direction to go. Yeah, I think that's good to show an example of something to, to give that idea. One of the questions in the chat is using barbecue sauce as an example, what quantity should be produced for your consideration as a distributor? Now, do you mean in order to like quantity produce, like how big should they be? Or what did you mean by that? Or just in general, all amount of bottles, how many bottles should be produced? Well, um, Marcus, what would you say if you pick up a new barbecue sauce customer vendor, um, how much should they produce for you? Is that kind of determined by how many accounts pick up their sauce? Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good question. I, I think uh, what you'll find is if you're doing it, if, if you're having it outsourced, if somebody's packing it for you, they're going to have their own minimum. So if you're doing it in-house, uh, it really depends on, uh, again, I, I, I think it's it's always a plus to say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm making this many because I've got 20 customers right now that I do myself. So that'll kind of help us gauge, you know, how many you should make. So it's, it's really a tough question to answer uh, without uh, – you know, having some more information. Well, I'm trying to make use that we have four minutes left, so I want to make sure we get every bit of this out. Um, what would be one thing that would prevent someone, prevent you from working with a new account? What would be a red flag, possibly? Well, not to be trite, but obviously if you can't uh, get the food safety thing done, that's that's a red flag. I mean, that's um, uh, you know, if you're not able to do that, then what else are you not able to do or what, what are you not doing? So not that, not that I'm saying that if, uh, you're doing farmer's markets or, you know, some of your own stuff that you're not, uh, reputable or, you know, trustworthy, but we simply cannot engage with someone that doesn't have that just because of the liability. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what would be uh, a big, what would be one of the biggest things that would cause a producer to lose an account? So, you know, how, when you lose a vendor, what are some of those causes? Oh, if you drop someone. Question. Well, I mean, I just think basic business uh, practices, you know, if you say you're going to do something, then you need to do it, right? And we all understand that there can be supply chain challenges, you know, packaging challenges. Uh, but, you know, if we're going to come and we're going to pick up product at your place and you're, you're not there, you know, you're not uh, communicating with us. I mean, we simply, no one has time for that, that type of thing. So lack of communication or little to no communication uh, is, a, is a big problem for us. Okay. So it sounds like the biggest things are when you're talking to new customers, they have to have proper food safety, provable certifications, yep. cert all, all of it, top to bottom, insurance that's required from any distributor, um, packing, you know, and you can kind of help them through that. If they're not quite there in the packing, you can take them through the warehouse and say, well, normally this oh, is yeah. how tomatoes come in. And sometimes you can give them the name of, of a great place they could buy corrugated from, or, you know, you can give them resources. I've, I've seen it in, in the past. You all have a lot of yep. people that you know out in the industry. And then they need to kind of have a good handle on the price. They really shouldn't come to you and say, how much should I ask for for my blueberries? They should really come in the door already knowing that. And then, you know, they need to have some yeah. business some interest already before they come in the door. Yeah, if, if, they do all that stuff and makes things a lot easier. And Perfect. you know, we, it's a two way street. I mean, we don't, we look at this as a partnership, you know, what really, you know, what, what uh, our value proposition to our customer is service and quality. So, you know, we're only as good as a, a good vendor. So, you know, we want to have great products uh, to offer our customers because that's why they turn to us, you know, so, 
it's it's important for us to hitch our wagon to someone that's that's got good product. For but sure. please, no more barbecue sauce. No <laughs> more barbecue sauce. We do have a lot of barbecue sauce in Indiana, I will say. Well, we've hit our time. Yeah, so I want to thank you so much, Marcus. Um, Agresta from no, Kiosk Specialty Foods. Thank you. I appreciate it. Ashley, your hand was up. I'm sorry I didn't see it. Um, Sarah, I'm going to turn this back over to you and mute myself. Thank okay. you so much for having me. Thanks to both of you. I really appreciate I know it's hard because we could probably fill a semester's worth of um, time with all the good information from Heather and Marcus. Um, both of their email addresses have been put into the chat. And since we are at the 1230 mark, um, we need to move to the next thing. Um, so we have Mike Hoopgardner and we also have Barbara Wilder. Uh, Barbara is with the Broad Ripple Farmers Market and Mike Hoopgardner is with Caprini Creamery. They're gonna talk for the next um, 20 to 30 minutes on do's and don'ts at the farmer's market. So especially since Barbara, um, let's see, you said it was 16 years you've been volunteering. She's mm -hmm. probably seen all the good, the bad, and the ugly. So um, I'll let you guys share your screen and all the great information. or let me know if you need help and I can. Yeah, I'm not seeing my share screen option like I do. Is it down towards the bottom? Sometimes it kind of hides itself. You got to take the cursor down there to hunt for it. Hmm. If it helps. Let's see, I can do mine. Do you see what you wanna see up there now? Oh, wait a minute, now I can find it. I found the share screen if you wanna give it back to me. Okay. <laughs> it just appeared when you did that. Oh, wait a minute, now it went away. That's because I was sharing, that's probably why. Uh, I'll click through, so here we go. I've got the first one up for everybody to see. Um, you guys go ahead. Down. Be watching their phone instead of paying attention to customers. Uh, and that's what happened with this one vendor and they stopped sampling and it's a product I personally wouldn't buy without sampling and it was a salsa. And they finally just decided they had to close the business because they just, they weren't selling enough. But I'm also hearing you guys say that Obviously, the vendors want to be successful, and a good market master wants their people to all be happy and be successful. You want the customers to be happy and successful, so you're working to kind of facilitate and make that happen. You're there for them. Okay, we are at one o'clock, though, so I hate to cut it off, but we need to switch. We have another great presentation here. Um, thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Mike. Thank and, you. Yeah, um, Lee Rowan was supposed to be here, but there was a family situation that came up, unfortunately. Um, so you guys did great. Very happy to have you and happy to have the next people. Um, Erin Peckinpah, she is actually kind of a marketing, I'm gonna say genius. <laughs> um, she's just worked a lot with different places in the past 15 years, Indianapolis, um, NBC and CBS affiliates. She's currently the vice president of marketing at a large Indianapolis law firm, and she has taken a special interest in Indiana agriculture and working with farmers to improve their brand. So I'm going to let um, Mike and Aaron go from here. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that kind introduction. It's such an honor to be here, especially among such great people. The Broad Ripple Farmers Market is just pure magic. Barbara and Mike do such a good job. All the vendors do an amazing job. And to be able to pivot and change locations and reinvent themselves a number of times is just amazing, the marketing. And they have a great person doing their marketing. So if you're not following their Instagram and Facebook, Highly recommend it, very engaging content. 
So an honor to be here. Also, Heather Tallman, what a rock star. Talk about knowing Indiana farmers. That woman is amazing. I've never seen someone be more places at once all across the state. So with that, we will start. Sarah, if you're okay, I'll do a screen share. You go right ahead. Okay, perfect. We'll dive right into it. So today we will be talking about what is your brand and how to sell your product. Mike probably did a little bit of this in the last session, just talking about how he's moving product, how he continues to engage customers, but we'll also talk a little bit about your brand. So the, the number one mistake I've seen most clients make is they try to be all things to all people. So instead of planting a flag and figuring out exactly who you are, who your niche is, who your target audience is, they try to be everything to everyone. And it, it's always better if you pick one thing and you do it really well. So you'll see that with people like Mike, he is the goat farmer, he's the goat guy, he's the goat cheese person. So he planted his flag, he literally with his own hands built his farm, and then he moved forward from there. So, so don't be all things to all people. Is there anyone on, on this call who feels a little overwhelmed or confused about marketing? Maybe throw up a thumbs up or give me a wave. It can be a very overwhelming space. And the reason for that is all of the options. So if you're looking at traditional media, you might have things like billboards. You might have broadcast television, which I spent a, a lot of my career at the CBS and NBC station. You might have consider something like connected TV. It's also called OTT, which is over the top device television. I'm currently doing a campaign with connected TV and we have 487 options for streaming. So that can be a little overwhelming. You have things like the Indianapolis Star, you have radio, but also you have Spotify and Pandora streaming devices. You have the IBJ, you have Indianapolis Monthly, you have all of your circulars like the Broad Ripple Circular. You have SEO, which is your free advertising. So this is where your website will come into play or your PR that you get. You have paid search, which is called SEM. You have audience targeting options, and then you have all of your so social media options. So you have Facebook, you have Instagram, you have TikTok, you have Snapchat, you have YouTube, and whatever else the kids have discovered yesterday that will become relevant tomorrow. So I can understand why someone in your shoes might be, or your boots might be slightly overwhelmed by all of the options out there, but I have really good news for you. The good news is people want to hear from you. They want to hear from Barbara. They want to know what vendors are, will be at the market that Saturday. They want to know your story now more than ever. So a good friend used to have a statistic where he would say 1% of the population is responsible for feeding the other 99%. And that's you, that's the farmer. So keep in mind that people will always need to eat. So your product will always be relevant. And I've worked with a lot of different clients and I can't say that to all of them. So you have a, you're, this is a good space to be in when you're considering what your marketing campaign will be and what it will look like. There's a really good book. Oh. Let's start with the purchase funnel. So this is a really good thing to understand. So when your potential customer is considering buying your product, there is a, a funnel. And in order for them to get to the actual purchase point, we recommend in marketing that you reach that person on average seven times. So at the top of the funnel, you might have your awareness. So you might have signage at a farmer's market, and that's where someone is first exposed to you. Or maybe you sponsor a little league team, or maybe you have an ad in a circulator or circular or edible indie. So that would be more of your awareness. And then they start to be interested in your product. Then they consider it, and then they have an intent to purchase. Then they might evaluate you, and then they make the move to purchase. So on average, for most categories, you want to think about reaching that person seven times. That might feel overwhelming, but just remember your, your farm, driving by your farm could be one of those times. Being at that farmer's market seven different times. So that's how you're constantly engaging and interacting with your potential customer. At the bottom of that funnel, that's more of your move to purchase. So if you were to do a digital ad and it were to have a, an offer for that day, two stakes for the price of 20, then that's at the bottom of the funnel. So that moves them to your website where they can actually maybe make a purchase. 
So think about reaching that customer seven times. If you need to set a goal, that's a, that's a great goal. Building your brand. There's a really good book called Building a Brand Story. It's a very quick read. You could probably read it on a Saturday or a Sunday or a Monday morning. And there's a quote in there. People do not buy the best products. They buy the ones they can understand the fastest. You don't have a lot of time to explain who you are. So what Mike mentioned, when he's in line and people are buying the cheese, he has a very short time to captivate them. He doesn't want to make anyone feel like he doesn't want to hear from them, but he has to move people on so he doesn't lose those potential customers in line. So you have to be pretty quick. And there's that old school, what is your elevator speech? I recommend that you have one, that you can pull it out at restaurants when someone says, tell me more about your farm, tell me what you do. Why is your farm better and why do I need to support you? maybe put together a 60 second elevator speech. They need to understand quickly who you are. And, and we talked about earlier, planting that flag. So don't be all things to all people, but be who you are and own that space. Your competitive edge. People do not buy goods and services, they buy relationships. They are craving interaction with you. They want to meet you. So where can you go to meet people? How can you take the farm out on the road so people have an easy time interacting with you? One magical place is the farmer's market. I'm sorry, I'm gonna talk a lot about Broad Ripple. I think they do things better than anyone in the city, but no offense to all the other markets. I'm sure they're great. I just tend to go to Broad Ripple a lot more because it's in my backyard. But think about the magic that goes on there. You have this dog that's gone to Three Dog Bakery. He's walking around with his owner. You have all this opportunity to engage with people to meet the farmer. You have the honey man. He's got his local honey. Everybody loves him. He's always going to give you a free stick to give to your child. It's creating a moment, engaging with the customer, leaving them feel like they've, they've had a magical experience. It's a great way to do it. But in this space, Full Hand Farms is another great one. If you're not following them across social media, they do a really good job with their display. So I would encourage you, if you do enter the event space where you're engaging with your, your customer, maybe sit down and talk with a marketing person about what your signs look like. What does your booth look like? How inviting is it? What do you have that makes it more beautiful? How do you have things displayed? It would be worth an hour conversation with someone who really is good in the event space to say, here's what you need. And then you build out your little tub and you can set it up every time you go to an event and you just have everything you need right there. So these are, these are a couple examples of ways to engage with the customer and making sure that your space is inviting because it's really a, a mobile storefront that you're creating every single Saturday. So you want to treat it like that and you want it to be beautiful and inviting. I think I've taken a picture of the full hand farms produce spread every time I've gone to the market. So a great place to look. Also, there's the flower farm. Her name is Harvest Moon Flowers. I hope I got it right. She's another good example of someone who has a beautiful display. Next, we'll talk a little bit about social. I know that this is a confusing space. I know that most clients or farmers or people in this space are a little overwhelmed by it. They don't want to wake up every day and have to live on Instagram or Facebook or TikTok or Snapchat. They wanna just do, do the job, do the work, get the work done on the farm. This is a, a great space though to, without paying money, reach a huge, reach and build and create a huge audience and it's free. So that is the key word here. It's very important to understand why creating a social media presence benefits you. So we talked about search engine optimization, and that's your unpaid way of getting your name to the top of the Google ranking. Facebook is one way that you can achieve this. So what I would recommend in your case, I would say, don't try to do it all. Don't try to be on TikTok and Snapchat and YouTube and Twitter and Instagram that will drive you mad. Pick one and do it well. And for your demographic, I think Facebook would make the most amount of sense. So if you're moving forward with creating a Facebook presence, pick one and do it well. So that's with Facebook. Step one would be creating your page. So what you can do if you have your personal page is you can create a business page and you can have a toggle option. 
So if you go onto your personal page to connect with your friends and family, you can toggle down to, for example, Red, Red Bud Farm and Caprini Creamery. Step two, you wanna create a social media calendar. So first you build it, then you create the content. So in this arena, content is king. I am currently working for a law firm. Guess what? People don't really wanna hear from us. So that can be tricky. No one on this call today probably wants to hear from an attorney. So we have to be very creative about how to captivate our audience. So the first thing we did when I, so we started with about 700 followers. We have a law firm of 75 people. So I thought that number looked a little low and we set a goal to quickly grow that audience to double in size. So step one, we created the social media calendar and we stuck to it. So a good place to start is just look at all of the holidays through the course of the year, lay that on the calendar, and then think about your local communities, regardless of where you are in the state. Think about things that are important to your local audience. So for Indianapolis, think about the month of May. The minute May 1st rolls around, everyone's thinking about the race. So you can create a lot of compelling content around that. You think about the cult season starting, just think about anything relevant to your potential customer and then build it out. For us, we have every single day, we have something that we feature. So we have Motivation Monday, we'll include a motivational quote. We have Testimonial Tuesday, where we'll feature a quote from a client that we feature in our television ads. We have Employee Feature Wednesdays. I just saw that Full Hand Farm did, a, did an employee feature that did really well. When I first started with the company, this was our highest engaged content. And I like to say it's because only our employees were the ones following us. So that's why we got such a high level of engaged engagement with it. But people love when you feature your own employees. We would do Google reviews Thursdays, and then we would have a feature on an adoptable animal based on a partnership we have with Indie Humane. We also do a lot of monthly ticket giveaways. We have Colts and Pacers giveaways. And then if you want something a little more affordable, maybe it's the Indians and maybe you look at the Indiana State Fair. So it'd be really fun for you to be giving away tickets to something relevant in, in farming. Step three, and I think I already said it once, content is king. So you can create your page, but if you don't tell your story, how are you going to build that audience and how are you going to continue to get people to like you? So I mentioned Full Hand Farms. Here's a good example. They did an employee feature. They show the farm, look at the beautiful produce. There's a wonderful picture with it and they're engaging their audience. So they're reminding people we're here, look at the work we're doing. When they're closing the produce season down, you'll see the last day when they're opening it, they start digging, you'll, you'll, you're there with them. So invite people onto your farm and tell that story. Also, another good thing that, that Mike does is he promotes other businesses. It's not just about Caprini Creamery Cheese. He'll mention Tulip. He'll mention some of his, who we would view as competition. But what that's doing is that's saying to the customer, I know this space is pretty big, support us, but support them too. So it's okay to talk about other local farmers and what they're out there doing. That, that always makes you look better. We did a TV campaign once where the owner of the company, it was an HVAC company, said, before you buy a new HVAC unit, you need to talk to three companies, just make sure I'm one of them. So that was a good way of, of not saying, I'm the best, look at me, only come to me, but you need to do your research, you need to talk to others and just make sure that I'm a part of that conversation. So there's a lot of good way to do this, but you have to create the content. Anything happening in the community is good. If you wanna share local stories, maybe Indiana Grown does their feature on Wish TV. That would be a great story to share. So any, anything you can do to push any word out about farming or anything good happening. If there's a 4-H national story about someone who's done something really cool in that business, that's a really good thing to share. So it's okay to share content and it's okay to create your own content. Just make sure you're creating content. Content is king. Step four, you need to grow the audience. It can be hard to do this. It can be hard to ask your friends and family to support you. Maybe you're, you're proud of what you're doing, but maybe you kind of want to keep things separate. You want your friends on your friend page and you want your family on your, your friend page and you want to keep the business separate. But the only way to grow your audience is to ask for the like. So you already have your community. If you have your personal Facebook page, ask everyone who's your friend already to like your business page. If you don't ask for it, people will not 
do it. You have to ask for it. So ask for the like, invite your personal network. I mentioned earlier, we started at 700. We've grown to 3,500 in a matter of six months by simply promoting engaging content. So we are speaking to our audience and we're inviting people to like us every single day. My ultimate goal is to see our page personally at 50,000. I know that's gonna take a lot of work, but every single Tuesday, we're looking at these numbers. We know what the goal is and we continue to pursue it. So I think it's important to set a goal. And then ask your partners to tag you. This is a great example. This is Red Fraser Bison Ranch down in Southern Indiana. They did a special during Valentine's Day. They did two steaks, I think for $20 and they had the Broad Ripple Farmers Market tag them and promote them. So use your existing partnerships. If you're in a restaurant, have them tag you, have them share your farm story. This is a good way to reach a different audience and then maybe build, build your, your own audience and then set measurable goals. So it's important to know where you're going. It's important to have that content calendar to follow and then set measurable goals. Step five, if you don't wanna do this, it's okay. A lot of people don't. There are many good young people who want experience on a farm. So Butler University has a great program where all they do is place interns. So it's a great, that would be a great connection. Reach out to Butler, see if anyone would be interested in learning more about agriculture and hire an intern to do this for you. The other thing you can do is hire a social media strategy company. If you have a budget that you can set aside for this, I've seen these proposals range from $500 to 5,000 a month, but you can get this done on the lower end. You just have to make sure that you're clear about what you wanna accomplish and you're getting this company images and things to help you be successful. So this will take a little effort. I'd recommend meeting with a company like this once a week to start with, just so you're all on the same page and you can track your numbers and, and they can prove to you that they're growing your audience. Even if you did a strategy like this for six months just to build the audience, I think it makes a lot of sense. Full disclosure, we do contract with a social media strategy company. So we're not doing it all ourselves. We've asked for help and it's paying off for us. So they're helping us grow a lot. And then use services like hootsuite.com to schedule your posts. So if this is not something you wanna do every day, if it's your worst nightmare to get out and take a picture of the sunrise on the farm or the sunset on the farm, you can collect all those images or partner with a local photographer who can shoot those for you. And then you can schedule those out with, with hootsuite.com. That's the one I would recommend. And then don't be overwhelmed by this. I know I'm throwing a lot at you, but people, I go back to what I said in the beginning, people really want to hear from you now more than ever. That is the good news. You are someone that they want to hear from. One surprising marketing trend for 2022, is the comeback of the QR code. This was something I sort of despised when they initially rolled this out, but then people started to go back into restaurants when it was possible. And they started to only be able to ask to, to access the menu by scanning a QR code. So thanks to our local restaurants, they've retrained customers to expect a QR code. And now you're going to see these everywhere. So you'll see them on television commercials. You'll see them on billboards, which is a little dangerous. You'll see them on signs out in fields. So I highly recommend examining the QR code. You might say, how the heck am I going to do that? There is a website called flowcode.com where you can create. We just did this last week. We created our own QR code and we took it live on our OTT commercial. So we built out a commercial where we now have our Q QR code. So we can see how many people are watching the commercial and scanning that QR code. What I would recommend here though, is don't send these individuals to your website, send them to where they can buy your product. So if you have an e-commerce site, that's great. I know a lot of you may not have that. Go to where on your website, you can go and access your product. So there has to be a page on your site where people know where they can come find you. So if you have a URL with this QR code, I highly recommend just making it very easy for the customer to scan that and come find you. The other marketing trend, which is like, did this ever really go away? You'll start to see, in fact, I just watched a bus, a Geico bus roll by that said, we're local. 
So this will be the next thing that you're going to start seeing on billboards, on commercials, on digital ads, support the local guy. There's a lot of these Chicago businesses and New York businesses, and even in the ag world, maybe national companies coming in and, and fighting for your share. But people are really wanting to shop local. So I know this is a message that's been done a lot, um, but this is something that's really important for you to remind people is I'm here, I'm in the state, I'm working hard and I deserve your business. So promoting local shopping is crucial. If you do decide to continue down the road of social media and you wanna boost some of your posts, it's actually pretty easy to get that done once you dive into Facebook and start to play around, but you should begin with the basics. You need to know who your target audience is, what are the demographics? If you are a farmer's market vendor, this is a really good way to get this done. So watch who comes up to your booth, watch who the actual purchaser is. So if it's the woman saying, hey, go buy me that cheese or go get me those flowers or I want some of that jam, she's really your target demo. So watch who's, who, who's driving that actual point of purchase. Make sure you're focusing on their age, their gender, what do they do for a living? Where do they live? Once you get to know them, these are questions you can ask. What's their highest level of education? Might be a weird question to ask, but important things to know. And then target the highest engaged time period. If you're trying to drive people to farmer's markets, post between one and three. You may think if someone's come and bought your product one time that they will always know you're at the market, but you have to hit them over the head with this message. You can't say enough times on Friday and Thursday that you're going to be at the market. People assume, who knows, is Mike gonna be there? Did something come up? Will, will I be able to see him? They may wonder, so you need to be the one telling them, I will be there Saturday morning. Come see me, rain or shine, 8 a.m. To, to noon. So you have to remind them every single week where you're going to be. I know that feels obnoxious, but people have to be hit over the head because they're getting so many different marketing messages coming at them. So a good time to post just based on research is between one and three on Thursday and Friday. If driving online sales, you might look at Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. These tend to be higher productivity days at noon during that lunch hour. If you're telling your farm story, go after Sunday. People are, it's a little slower on Sundays, but try to hit the before church audience at 8 a.m. or after 8 p.m. And then do what Mike does. He tends to post at 5 a.m. to be the first view. So a lot of people, what they're doing, and you might be guilty of this, I know that I am, the alarm goes off and what do you do? You reach for your phone and then you have your habits. Maybe you go to Instagram, maybe you go to Facebook, maybe you decide what your calendar is gonna look like that day, maybe you're checking your outlook. So that habit is to go to your social and you wanna be the first thing that they see every single morning. So it's a good idea even to look at posting if you're up at five and there's a beautiful sunrise or your, your animals look beautiful or the produce just looks stunning that day, it's okay to share that at 5 a.m. And Mike, I don't know, do you wanna to touch on this? Just the importance of asking for the sale? You're on mute, there you go. Now I'm there, yes. Um, yeah, that is something that, um, I've noticed over the years, not only just with farmers and vendors, but small business people in general is, I don't wanna say having the courage, but it sometimes is having the courage to ask for a sale. Um, you spent all this time talking to the customer. And so do you want the feta or the chev today? And if they say they wanna think about it, that's great. But if you can make a mental note to see them next week when they walk by, hey, did you think about the feta or the chev? And boom, they're like, hey, I do. I want the feta today. Or if you're talking to a chef or you're talking to a distributor, uh, you've got to be able to close the sale and ask for the sale. You, you're doing your business you're doing the best job for your business if you ask for that sale. And you're gonna to get told no. And I took this course, and this has been a long, long time ago, um, the, like Tom Hopkins course in real estate. And they talked about how you need 50 no's to get to one yes. 
Mm. So a lot of times I'm counting in the back of my head, hey, I got 10 no's, I'm on my way to a sale, and you just keep plugging along. And no is okay. Um, knowing the customer, meeting the customer where they live, inviting them where you live. And Aaron touched on that. It's just huge. And then the last thing as part of that asking for the sale. So, so many times people, especially when you're dealing in the business world, well, get me some information and let me think about it. Call them. Call them more than once, especially if they're the decision maker. If you have managed to work your way through Piazza Produce to the decision maker or Delco Foods or Ideal Foods or at a restaurant, you've talked to a server, the server then says to the chef, and then you get to meet the chef. You're talking to the decision maker. Don't be afraid to call them. You can tell a lot of times by the tone of their voice on a phone call, what's going on? Are they really interested? Or are they really not interested? Can't do that with email, can't do that with social media, DM, all that sort of stuff. That, that voice means a lot. And I've watched you do this time and time again, Mike, walking into Amelia's, they know you by name, they want to see you, just not forgetting that in this industry, you are magic, you are doing what most people are terrified to do. You're building a farm with your own hands and you're pushing your product out. You are a salesperson, you're a business owner, you're the fixer of all the machinery. And I know that can be a nightmare to itself. You do all of the work. So you're wearing all the hats, but to, to the general public, to the me's of the world, you're pure magic. So use that to your benefit. People want to meet you. They want to see you. They want to hear your story. The chefs want to sit down with you. Now, a bad time to visit a chef might be 4 p.m., right, Mike, before they start the night shift. So really be strategic. Most chefs might get into a restaurant around between noon and three to start prepping for that evening meal. And these are the executive chefs, the decision makers. So you want to figure out what those, those trends look like. But if it's at four, ugh, bad time to, to reach a potential chef. So think about the times when you're going in direct to, to restaurants, when to visit that person. Also to piggyback off what Mike said, call, no one calls anymore. I get maybe 50 to 70 media inquiries of trying to people, of people trying to get, to get me to do business with them, but no one is calling. So I might get seven calls from people that I don't know that I haven't done business with a month. So if you know how to leave an effective voicemail and you're not afraid to pick up the phone the next week and call me back and it's something that I'm slightly interested in and I want to hear you out, I'm more likely to return that call because you had the guts to pick up the phone. So I can say firsthand when you're when you're trying to make a sale, email if 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 your potential customer doesn't recognize you, they haven't done business with you, you may as well just throw it in the trash. Direct mail is the same if you if you do mailers, there are usually three piles. There's the trash pile, and those are the people you haven't done business with. There's your bills, most important pile, unless you want to throw those in the trash sometimes too. And then there are the people that you've done business with. So the most important pile are your bills and the people you've done business with. So if you're not someone that someone knows, just don't even waste a single dime on direct mail. So good points, Mike. Thank you. And then when telling your story, just be authentic, be true to you. Don't try to be someone you're not. No one likes an ego. Um, if you have one, that's okay. Um, but just be true to you. So tell your story. People want to know your story and be authentic to who you are. If you are a first generation farmer, I, I want to know that because I know that you put your boots on and got out there and, and got it done. So be authentic and be true to you. All right. I don't, Sarah, I think we might be, I, yep. I think we might be close, right? We're doing great. Um, okay. We've hit the 130 mark. We definitely um, want to leave time here because there is one question in the box. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask that you stop sharing. Yep, sure. I'll read you the question. Do you have contact information for the program at Butler University? I have two farms that need interns. Yeah, if you want to share your email address, absolutely. Um, I would love to email that contact directly to you. 
So I'm, I'm, I have the chat. So if you want to share your personal email, whoever's asking that question, mm -hmm. Scott Peters, is, yeah. um, and reminder, everybody, Ashley has put the evaluation link that you can click directly on that. I'm going to share my screen. So you could also maybe see the QR code. Also, we didn't really touch on this, Scott, but LinkedIn is a really great tool to recruit. It is also free. Um, there's a lot that you can do with it. So if you have a write-up of the intern that you're looking for, for these two farms, that's another great, and Indeed would be the next place I would look. We have a lot of success with recruitment in those two spaces. And I received another message in the chat that is a, a good question, I think. Um, so if I could ask that real quick. Uh, the question is, I'm planning on raising my veggie tomato prices this year due to increased expenses, and I'm expecting pushback from consumers. What advice do you have on the best response? I honestly, my response to that is I wouldn't worry about that in this day and age, as I may have worried about it a year ago. So that might be a, something that's caught more in your head. I don't think people, especially it, depending on where this product is going, if it's going to farmer's markets, I definitely would not be concerned about the increase in price. So if you do get pushback on that, I would like, I would lean toward asking for contact information so you can follow up with that individual. So you can explain why the price has gone up in a very matter of fact, factual way. I don't think you need to get into the, hey, it was more expensive for the plant or the seeds were more expensive or it's, it's been a challenging year to grow my product. I don't think you need to get into the details, but I don't think this will be as big of a concern as you think, especially if it's more of a farmer's market approach. People are going to spend money there. They're not as worried about the increase in price. So I would say get the contact information so you can have a sidebar professional dialogue with that individual. That's a great question. Yeah, and I'm right there with Aaron. You just gotta tell them why. Yeah, yeah. And if you've built a relationship with them, 99% of the time they're gonna understand and just go right along with you. Also, there's, there's been a major increase in gas prices. That's a pretty basic, like people can wrap their head around that. So gas prices set the industry standard. So you automatically expect things to increase a little bit. So that could be a really easy way to explain why your prices have gone up a little bit to the average consumer. Thank you. Yeah. And before we go, I just, I always try to mention this. It used to drive my daughter nuts, especially when she was a teenager. But she knew as soon as the truck left the driveway and was on our county road, I could start selling at any moment. Mm -hmm. So that elevator talk that Aaron was talking about, I, I could start my pitch just driving down the road. I could get stopped by a car on the road. Hey, are those your goats? And then I'm off. And it starts as soon as I leave the driveway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good point. Very good. Um, I'm sharing a few little last slides here. Hopefully everybody's um, just probably overwhelmed with great information that we've had today. And so, I encourage you to stay here and ask questions if you have time. Uh, we really appreciate everybody attending. Save the date, um, 2023. I've got that up there, March 3rd, 4th, and 5th in Hendricks County. And again, the um, link for our survey is in the chat box. And also I'll say, Sarah, um, I'm putting my email, my personal email in here. I'm not trying to sell anyone anything, but I love to help people in agriculture. So if anyone has a question about maybe they wanna hire a social media content strategist company, I've worked really hard to vet these companies out and to see who's the real deal and who will take good care of their client. So I'm happy to be a resource for anyone on any question at no cost.
Well, that was great. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, we appreciate everybody, the speakers, the sponsors, of course, the participants that have been here today. Um, so I guess that's a wrap, but we'll be hanging out. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you.